Hafide, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our COVID-19 press conference on our reopening plan for the island of Guam. At this time, I'd like to recognize the presence of the Honorable Lourdes A. Leon Guerrero, Magahag and Guahan, Governor of Guam. I'd also like to acknowledge that Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio extends his apologies for not being able to attend today. He has a family funeral. To the governor's right, we have GVB President and former Governor Carl Gutierrez. To the governor's left, we have State Surgeon and former Lieutenant Governor and GVB Recovery and Reopening Task Force Committee member, Dr. Mike Cruz. We also have with us here in our um, conference room, Vice Chairman of the GVB Recovery and Reopening Task Force Committee, Ben Ferguson. And joining us via Zoom on our panel, we have Public Health Director Art St. Augustine, as well as Public Health Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Felix Cabrera. I now like to give the floor to Governor Leon Guerrero for her remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Crystal, and thank, thank you for uh, participating on this press conference today where we are going to talk about uh, our reopening plan. Uh, one year ago today, as you saw in the video, uh, which depicted a really good historical uh, accounting of what we had gone through with fighting this uh, COVID-19, um, we began our fight. Because of your patience, your commitment, your willingness to protect each other and our island, we are here today, and I must say that we have done a great job in containing this virus and making our numbers low. As we rebuild our island anew, we are announcing our reopening plan. Everything we're doing has been done in partnership with the medical advisors, public health, and we've been meeting extensively over the last uh, couple of months to determine the goals our medical team was comfortable meeting before proceeding with the official reopening of Guam. Members of our panel to discuss that today, you have uh, Ben Ferguson, who is the vice chair of the task force committee for recovery and uh, reconciliation of the GVB. And then uh, I have, of course, Art St. Augustine, Director of our Public Health and Social Service, and our Surgeon Cell um, <clears throat> direct, uh, Head, Dr. Mike Cruz, and of course, former Governor Carl Guterres, who is also the GVB President and CEO. And uh, we, what we have been doing was we've been meeting, and the task force has been meeting, to get a a better perspective of what we need to do in order to start our plans for reopening uh, to travelers. Uh, we are setting ourselves on what we call a path to half. And what we've been discussing and we've agreed on is that if we are fully vaccinated, 50% of our adult population, this is 16 years or older, by May 1st, we will reopen our borders to travelers. And what that means is that if we get 62.5 a thousand is our target number. If we get that by May 1st, we would feel uh, more comfortable about community protection and safeguards for our community. What does travel reopening mean um, for our people? It basically means that we make adjustments to our quarantine requirements. We are going to change our travel requirement protocols uh, as we see these numbers and as we get this 50% uh, vaccination of our population. This is an exemption process to government and home self-quarantine. So if someone, whether resident or non-resident, uh, whether from the U.S. or otherwise, enters Guam with a negative PCR test 72 hours before arrival, they can avoid quarantine, both government and home and self. But they must download the COVID alert app and must enroll in SARA alert for 14 days. If they do not have that negative test, they will follow our current protocol. In other words, they will have to go to quarantine in government facility. 
Our plan is also contingent about knowing that the COVID-19 variants do not escape the vaccine. How does this differ from our Operation Liberation uh, Liberate Guam? Of course, our ultimate goal for uh, the Operation Liberate Guam is to fully vaccinate 80% of the adult population by July 21st, 2021. This goal of fully vaccinating 50% of May 1st, 2021 was a threshold designed to adjust travel quarantine requirements. We still have a lot of preparation to do, and we need to ensure these goals are met before reopening. But we need to prepare now, and that is why we are making this announcement. Part of our initiative is to ensure industry workers are vaccinated and protected. We will continue with our robust testing protocol for industry workers. The Island Beautification Task Force is coordinating with GVB to clean up our island. We are going to have a set up steady vaccination and community testing schedule. We will have be ready and we stand ready to manage any potential spikes. The big goal is trying to figure out how to provide testing so people leaving Guam can get tested and don't have to quarantine. That is still in discussion. We have to do this right, and we have to do this safely. We absolutely do not want to go through another strict lockdown. This requires you, our community, to remain vigilant and to be careful and to continue wearing your mask, wash your hands and watch your distance, even if you are vaccinated and in accordance with CDC and Department of Public Health and Social Services guidelines. We are not out of the woods yet, and we don't expect normalcy until the end of the year or so. Thank you, and the panel is open to questions. Before we move to questions, I'd like to invite Dr. Felix Cabrera to share some slides. Uh, thank you very much, Crystal uh, Hafede Guam. Um, I just wanted to just share uh, this one uh, slide that kind of that we use to highlight, uh, you know, the main Guam COVID-19 metrics uh, as of uh, as of this morning. So we are currently sitting at a CAR score of 0 0.2 uh, right now, and as you can see here on the left, that represents uh, where we've been in the CAR score, not for the entire part of the pandemic, but uh, through the second wave uh, that we that initiated back in August. And as you can see, as we have progressed, uh, going as high as 46.8 or, or 47, and then the long stretch we've had of having a low car score uh, uh, from there. Now, on the right uh, corner, you see that our test positivity rate is now at 0.9%, uh, and that it's been as high as 17.5 uh, back, back in November. The effective retransmission value is more of a relative change that we, that we monitor in terms of how uh, the virus has been transmitted throughout the community and right now we're sitting at 0 0.9 and we want to stay below 1.0 because that uh, that helps us confirm that the that the pandemic is under control uh, uh, in when you compare the most recent weeks. Our daily new cases is at 2.6 and uh, sorry I felt to uh, remind that this is a seven day rolling average uh, that we use in our numbers here. And so these three uh, main values make up our CAR score and we now are sitting at 0 0.2. Um, of course, the CAR score means nothing if we don't uh, consider what are actual uh, the most important uh, endpoints that we uh, for us, which is, of course, um, hospitalizations and death. So right now we're sitting at 133 uh, total COVID related deaths and our active hospitalization is five uh, at this point in time. And so uh, obviously clearly not out of the woods here by any means, but uh, uh, considerably better, uh, especially when we think about our peak hospitalization of 102 back in November. I also uh, will take this moment to just um, add that um, our five-year um, overall death um, on Guam that we see is, a, is approximately 1,028. And in 2020, we had 1,172. So that's a total of 144 excess deaths just for 2020. Um, 123 of those were uh, determined to be COVID-related. And so, um, but yet there's a, um, as you can see that there's uh, 
other uh, deaths uh, that are not COVID related that contribute to the excess deaths. And again, that's why uh, the importance of, of, um, um, of doing the best we can because COVID also affects uh, non-COVID uh, health uh, concerns overall. The other thing to just highlight in this slide here is that our 28 day community case uh, sum, in other words, how many of our cases that we've had in COVID, the new ones um, in the past 28 days are from community spread and our number is at 45. And so that's important because this helps us understand where we are in terms of uh, what the CDC would determine our uh, risk travel. Um, and so right now we're, we're slated to, if we continue this to, to go under, uh, to go from a level three to a level two, and where more recently we were at a level four. So that, that's why this number is relevant. So our total vaccines given as of Saturday uh, is 6, 000, uh, 62,800. And so that represents 71.5% of our, our, of our stock that we have available. And so number of persons having uh, their first shot, that's 33,666. Now that makes up 20% of the entire population here. But when you look at the uh, overall population, uh, you know that I uh, sorry the adult population it's it's much higher. Those, those that are told uh, that have been fully vaccinated, meaning they've gotten both shots of the Pfizer Moderna, that makes up twenty nine thousand one hundred and thirty four. And of the entire population, you're looking at seventeen point three percent. However, if you look at the population that are sixteen and over, that's that makes up about twenty three percent. So in other words, the path to half means that we just have we have to double the amount of persons who are fully vaccinated today uh, and, and you know approximately double and so that's what will get us to that point where we'll have 50 percent of the adult population uh, uh, fully vaccinated and right now as we as we have it our daily vaccinations a seven day average um, where we are giving out 1157 uh, vaccines daily and and it, I think it, you'll see in the next uh, couple of weeks that we, that number will go up significantly. And so this is the only slide I, I wanted to share and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cabrera. Yeah. I now like to open the floor to questions from members of our media. We'll have two questions per round per media and we'll keep going until you, we've answered all your questions. Nick Delgado from the Guam Daily Post, you're first. Up there, everyone. Uh, so, Gov, uh, definitely a positive uh, push after a year of going through this pandemic for both the island and the rest of the world. And so, while you had mentioned that we're going to be uh, moving forward with those returning Guam residents or non residents from the US uh, to possibly uh, bypass the quarantine procedures if they have those uh, negative COVID tests, I'm wondering also about the source markets like Japan, Korea. Uh, do we see uh, us being ready as GVB is trying to eye? Uh, them returning to the island as well before the summer? Uh, and what kind of direct open lines of communications do we currently have in place with those markets? Um, yeah, so the uh, tourist travelers are in the same um, protocol as what we have today that we just announced. Um, GVB does say that they have been uh, communicating very closely with their market. And uh, although they, although we are going to be announcing the opening of May 1st, they don't expect to have an influx of tourists right away because, of course, it is dependent on what their country's uh, quarantine protocols are. But I am very confident that uh, as we continue forward with through the year and, and through next year that we will start seeing much more uh, tourism being uh, expanded in our island. Uh, and also we are marketing that, we are gonna be marketing that our island is safe. Um, uh, former Governor Carl Guterres and Ben might have more to say about that, but we have been communicating very closely with our uh, tourist market source and uh, we are preparing to open and we are um, very hopeful that they will start coming, not as much in the beginning, but I think throughout uh, the end of this year and the next year, we can probably see some very good results. 
Uh, ben? Yeah, if I may add to that, uh, the starting point for those discussions is with the consular, consular offices uh, of our source markets, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan, our primary source markets. And so discussions have begun with their uh, consular offices. And uh, thus far, those discussions have gone well. Um, obviously, as the governor points out, as long as our source markets have strict quarantine requirements in place for returning residents, we don't expect a lot of tourism. Uh, having said that, though, uh, we do feel as though there's some opportunities to work with our source markets, uh, in particular, probably Korea, first off, uh, as being a market that uh, would uh, be more likely to be willing to establish a travel bubble, if you will, uh, with Guam, uh, followed by our other source markets. So those discussions are ongoing through the consular offices. Thank you all for the response to that. Uh, my second question, uh, still COVID related, but not so much on the reopening plans. It has to do with the uh, paying out of the RISE Act. I understand, Gov, that your legal team has been reviewing that legislation or, or that law. Uh, has there been any determination yet when that payout will occur? No, um, they're still in discussions. And also I think they are working also with the AG um, uh, reviewing the RISE Act law, yeah. So nothing has been definitely uh, um, acted on yet. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. Nestor Lacanto, KUAM. Th thanks, Crystal. Hoffa to everybody. Uh, just to follow up on Nick's question. So what are the specific issues that are being looked into by the AG with respect to whether you're gonna implement the RISE Act? Yeah, so there's concern there, uh, Nestor, about uh, not allowing government employees or retirees to uh, take uh, advantage of the RICE Act. And uh, I think that's the major one. Uh, and also in discussion of as a result of the American Relief uh, Plan, which uh, gives 1400 uh to the dependents and also, of course, 1,400 to single filers who are below uh, 75,000 and, of course, 2,800 to those uh, joint filers who are below 150,000. And um, does, does that federal piece of legislation then supersede the RISE Act? So do we still have to um, abide or it's become now uh, a moot issue since the American Rescue Plan now is stepping in to provide that uh, uh, EIP plan. So those are some of the issues. Okay, um, so second question is, um, so you've indicated um, previously that you wanna set aside uh, 300 million of the 661 million that you're getting uh, to build a new hospital. Um, is that still the case? And I guess the question is why not spend it now for relief uh, rather than on a project that's still, you know, several years away, I would imagine at the earliest. Well, you know, um, Nestor, 300 million is going to benefit people, uh, yes, in the future. And uh, if I was going to be looking at maybe financing, it'll increase our debt service. And I don't know how that would work with uh, our debt ceiling also. Uh, and so, uh, in getting this 661 million, one of the uh, one of the reasons to use this or the requirement is anything that's negatively been impacted as a result of COVID, and we have seen very much demonstrated that our hospital was negatively impacted as a result of COVID. So I feel that this piece, uh, this uh, opportunity to now set aside some funding that we wouldn't have to provide, or that we wouldn't have to uh, um, put our people in debt is I think a great use of this money. And, and real quick uh, for uh, GBB President Carl or for Ben, um, who's gonna vet um, the in, inbound uh, tours arrivals for the PCR test? Is it gonna be the airlines? Are they gonna be at the airport or how's that gonna work? Understanding is that if it's an international flight, that they would be have to show their negative PCR before they 
um, they, before they get on the airplane. If it's uh, domestic flights, it'll be here on Guam when they arrive. Is that Thank you, Nestor. Yes, Steve Lemtiaco, PDN. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, so you mentioned earlier that uh, if, if people are allowed to bypass quarantine, they'd have to download an app and send sort of an alert. Could, could someone explain how that would work exactly? Is it the SAR alert or the COVID alert? Art um, St. Augustine is on the line. Okay. Art could probably talk, talk more yeah. about those. And so part of the plan, um, Steve, is that um, when you arrive in Guam, prior to arrival, we'll have you load up into the SAR alert and upon arriving, it's activated. So the plan basically is that we can monitor you from your location. You will receive a reminder to check in for symptoms. And if everything goes um, positive, of course, that you have no symptoms, then uh, you continue on. And if you submit a response in which you're starting to show report symptoms, we will then um, have to contact you and do an assessment at that point. So it's really monitoring, but through the electronic means. And so travelers will be required to download the SAR alert application and upon arrival into the alley. Thanks, and for my second question, um, you mentioned that the presence, the possible presence of, of COVID-19 variants might be an issue or, or in the, in the, in the uh, decision. Um, why would the presence of variants matter? If the COVID score is low, deaths are low, infections are low, does it matter that a variant may or may not be present on island? Yeah, um, it just, it, for me, and maybe Dr. Mike can speak more about it, uh, the COVID variant is a lot more, uh, can cause a lot more severity in the illness, and also it's much, much more infectious. So, of course, even if the COVID variant is in in, on the island, we will still monitor our hospitalization numbers, our CAR score, um, but we would be a lot more cautious about maybe uh, having people go straight to quarantine, I mean, sorry, straight home. Uh, and that's a discussion that we are uh, continuing to have within the medical uh, advisors and the surgeon cell. Um, but Dr. Cruz, I know, has uh, has uh, some opinion about that. Actually, uh, Lester, I'm actually hoping that every single variant is already here on Guam, frankly, because uh, if they're all here and our numbers show the po as positive as they currently are, then that's a good thing. But we don't know if any of the variants are here. We sent the test actually two months ago to CDC for sequencing. We still don't have the results back. So having looked at the experience of other places uh, and the obviously increased infectiousness of the, the variants, then we want to be concerned. But uh, again, I'm hoping that the variants are here, as, as, you, as you aptly stated. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Sir, CJ or Keith. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so what uh, will test be done at the airport as an added precaution for travelers, regardless of negative PCR results? And what would the procedure be if uh, tourists say test positive, even with a negative PCR? I mean, should you do testing at the airport? We are not going to be doing testing uh, on the air in the airport, uh, CJ, because it we we mapped it out and we felt that the process would delay um, our people from getting uh, through uh, customs and and immigration and so forth. So that's why we require that they have a PCR test before they come. And um, in, in light of uh, things reopening up, what, what is the exact date? And also, uh, when will service industry workers, uh, when will you start vaccinating them? Uh, the, um, the, right now, uh, GVB has sent out um, Increase to uh, together with the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, all of those industry uh, employees that that need to be vaccinated 
And so hopefully when we receive all that over the next week or so, and then we can make the determination to Dr. Cruz and the governor on how to, to implement the vaccination of the industry workers. So we're receiving that back right now uh, in the numbers and uh, where they're located. So hopefully uh, in the next week or two, uh, vaccination will begin for the uh, industry workers. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Jerry Partito, Pacific News Center. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you give us an update on the one dose proposal? Uh, I understand that's being uh, uh, proposed by the Physicians Actions Group. Uh, what, what does it mean when you say 50% uh, vaccinated? Is that fully vaccinated two dose or or just even the one dose proposed by the physician's advisory group? So 50% means uh, fully vaccinated. So it would be uh, the first and second dose. As far as the single dose uh, from the Johnson & Johnson, I believe that's still being, in, being uh, discussed among the uh, priority policy committee. Uh, and there's been some recommendations of who might get it but no, nothing uh, definitive action done yet. Art, I don't know if you want to add more to that. Absolutely, Governor, yes. Uh, for the uh, Vaccine and Antiviral Prioritization Policy Committee, which we refer to as VAPPC, with regards to the Johnson & Johnson single, single dose, uh, what was approved last Monday, or last meeting last week, was the those that are Homeless, our transient population, our, our high risk, at risk group, our seniors who are homebound uh, make it very difficult to go to a clinic or even to one of the public health or public health gun pods. And, and also those that are registered for adult daycare or, or senior citizen centers, again, the latter, the last one of the three, primarily looking towards opening, the reopening of our senior citizen centers and want to assist our seniors with a single dose so that they too would be inoculated and be able to enjoy the reopening of their senior centers. And so that's our single dose. Uh, there is a VA PPC meeting tonight and we will be discussing the expanding of the approved groups thus far. And I'll know more after our meeting this uh, evening, late, uh, early, late afternoon, early evening. Thank you. Yes, and uh, for my second question, uh, what does uh, official reopening mean? Does it mean 100% uh, uh, occupancy will be allowed in restaurants, bars, shopping centers? Is it, uh, is it basically no more restrictions, back to normal? No, it really just addresses the travel um, uh, protocols that we are going to start uh, um, changing and modifying so that we can start receiving uh, travelers so that they don't have to be uh, quarantined at home or through a government facility. So the, uh, what you described, Jerry, in terms of occupancy and all that, that's a, that's a recovery plan that we haven't yet uh, reached to that level. So uh, it does not mean 100% uh, opening of, of uh, our island. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Maureen Maritita, Mariana's Business Journal. Um, so, uh, buenas everybody, good afternoon. So as far as um, uh, port visits and military exercises, does that mean the military uh, will be um, also arriving with a PCR taken 72 hours before arrival. Is this something you've discussed with, um, with Joint Region here? No, Maureen, they're already doing exercises here and so forth. And I think, right. I know that uh, Admiral Minoni follows our protocol guidelines. He's very good at following ours. So when we do this, uh, he may also follow what we are saying. But um, uh, the military, I just have to say, are 
are uh, very much uh, in compliance with our protocols. And uh, they are also have their own um, quarantine procedures where they go, um, you know, how do they travel and so forth. So uh, we do work very closely with them. Uh, and I know that uh, when we do change any of our protocols or we do change uh, any of our levels, that uh, Admiral Minoni is notified and he's aware. And so he makes his uh, decision with his uh, people on how to uh, enforce that and implement that in the military side. Okay, thank you. So uh, for the second question, as we get closer to May 1, is it possible that we, um, if we won't see 100% uh, occupancy of uh, businesses or restaurants or whatever, that we might see an increase to perhaps 75% um, or additional loosening? Yeah, um, certainly that's the course that we are looking at in terms of our recovery plan. Um, and, and that's, again, um, being looked at, you know, uh, what does it mean? Uh, do we do 75% so that we can deliberately and cautiously, you know, uh, increase uh, even maybe social distancing. So af as we do that, we then collect data and uh, data to see whether our numbers are still okay. And once we do that, you know, we may even go further. So yes, just like we have done previously when we went from PCOR 1 to PCOR 2, we increased uh, to PCOR 3, we increased our social distancing, we increased uh, occupancy and so forth. That's how we would proceed towards um, some uh, confidence in community protection so that uh, we can return to normalcy. And just to clarify, because you touched on um, social distancing, um, I believe I heard the other day that Dr. Fauci was talking about a three foot uh, social oh. distance now. So is that something we'd look at or? Well, we really follow CDC and I'll tell you, Dr. Fauci is my uh, hero. Um, and, you know, he bases his information very much on science. And so if there's more evidence that three feet is okay, um, then, you know, three feet is okay. Uh, really, uh, he's been such a uh, very on point, right on in terms of the CDC guidelines. So uh, we do look at the CDC guidelines. We, we're not required to uh, implement all of the CDC guidelines, they do say it's also up to the states, but for the most part, we have uh, been following the CDC guidelines. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Maureen. And I believe it's for schools, reopening of schools is where he references three feet. Uh, back, oh, okay. back to Nick Delgado, Guam Daily Post. Do you have any follow-ups? Yes, I do. And so just to continue on with Maureen's question on the uh, capacity, uh, one of our readers is asking that is, so are we going to wait then till that May benchmark before we decide whether to lift the limitations on gathering uh, and capacities at the restaurants and bars and other businesses? No, we'll probably review it before then, based okay. again on our, uh, you know, our data, our car score and our hospital uh, admissions. Ah, so it could be sooner. Uh, I hope then, uh, so, Nick. I think everybody, you know, wants to get moving on with normalcy here. And again, I have to make the pitch that if everybody cooperates with what with with, with what we have been doing, it's going to work. It's going to work. And one part of the equation here that we're we're not leaving out is the fact that uh, as GVB moves forward with the Guam Hotel and Restaurant Association, we begin to start vaccinating the people because they've already returned all of their names of individuals and uh, their time schedule that as we as we ramp up the vaccinated people that are in the industry and that makes it easier for 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 the things to open up a lot for the for the governor to come in and say uh, okay we're we're pretty much every everybody at uh, at uh, lone star already is vaccinated maybe uh, they'll open up uh, 
to 75 percent. I don't know. But there's a lot of uh, possibility that the more we have people vaccinated uh, in the industry, the, the better the chances of uh, increasing the capacity. All right. Let me just add also that uh, part of the purpose of this press conference is not only to to make a, or to telegraph an announcement of a reopening plan, but it's also an appeal to the public, an appeal to the public to look at the vaccinations. We need you to go out and get vaccinated, and uh, you just like you've already done through the usage of your masks, through the social distancing and how we've done so effectively as a community in, in keeping our numbers down, driving it down and keeping it the way they are today. Now it's an appeal to, if you wanna to get to a, the new normalcy that we all want, then please uh, get vaccinated. Thank you. Uh, a second question uh, from one of our readers, they're asking, since it's going to be a requirement for travelers, incoming travelers to bring in those negative PCR tests, what uh, are officials doing to ensure that those documentations are legitimate and they don't come in with a, a fraudulent uh, results? Yeah, I know public health has that. Uh, I think there's a certain um, maybe laboratories that are certified. I know Art might might speak more to that. Apologies, I was on, on mute. Uh, the governor is actually on spot on that in that we can coordinate for those labs as we have in the past that are accredited, designated, approved, CLIA certified to be on a list so that we can issue that list comprehensively to those that are traveling to Guam as part of our travel advisory. Should you be planning to come to Guam and we hope many travelers do eventually in due time, do make Guam another destination, that they would be required to have a negative PCR upon arrival 72 hours prior to arrival into the island and then we could list what would be CLIA certified, CLIA approved laboratories within different parts of the US and perhaps other parts of the world. And so that would be pretty uh, comprehensive, but a task that our laboratory staff and the Division of Public Health can put forth. Uh, as we have actually done in a prior area in which we were working with the, um, the Philippines as well on this at one time. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Nestor Lacanto, KUAM, any follow up? Yes, uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, just wanted to go back to the 661 million, Governor. Uh, when will you be announcing a specific spending plan? And uh, will you accept any input from the legislature? Because they seem to be anxious to help you spend it. I think you're right on there, Nestor. <laughs> First of all, I have to say this, that um, this uh, 661 million is a direct uh, state aid from the federal government. And so it is given uh, to the discretion of the governors in the states and I have and territories. And I have to say this is something, um, Nestor, that has been lobbied uh, with Congress in terms of more flexibility to the use of these monies because of the fact that you know uh, revenues are lost as a result of COVID and uh, budgets are impacted as a result of COVID in terms of uh, uh, revenues. And so uh, the Congress uh, through, I think the also the um, strong support from President uh, Joe Biden that they have allowed the governors to use these monies for their discretion. Um, I just want to also tell the people this money is going to go out to the people in the community. It's not going to stay uh, with the executive branch. And I'm going to uh, assure you it's not going to be money for me to hire my uh, political, um, you know, partners as what the legislature, some of the legislature is saying. It is for the use of the public. So my priority is going to be putting it out into the hands of our people, into the small businesses, into nonprofit organization. I'm going to totally uh, support GVB in terms of their financing needs. We've been already discussing this with, with uh, Carl and his people. So it's going to stimulate the economy. It's going to make uh, the, the, the um, individuals 
feel like they have some means to rely on to put food on their table. It's going to help create jobs. Uh, all that is going to be pushed out. So uh, do I have details of it? No, I don't have details to the to the to the level of okay, this is how much you're going to spend for uh, pens. This is how much you're going to spend for paper. No, I don't have that. The general concept is that it's going to go into the hands of the people. It's going to be a priority for for those that are negatively impacted by COVID. Okay. And uh, yes, I am going to get the input of the senators. I already told them that once I develop my plan, like I did with the coronavirus fund, they will get it and they can have as much input as they can. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Uh, one last question for me, um, just uh, regarding the one-year anniversary of the public health emergency declaration. Um, if you were to grade your administration's response, uh, what would it be? And uh, are there any things you think you could have done better? I would grade it A plus and be in the National Honor Society. <laughs> and no, I don't regret any of the decisions I have made. Uh, Nestor, I feel like I have made the right decisions along. Uh, were there any um, processes that we could have improved? Absolutely. I would be uh, turning a blind eye if I said there wasn't. There were a lot of processes that we had to improve on. And the whole thing is this virus was an unprecedented pandemic. Nobody had history or experiences this. And so as we move along with the evolution of this virus, I think we adjusted quickly. I think we were flexible. I think people in my team were very united. They were very cooperative. They were very supportive. And we, we were leading with participative input and ideas from people. So no, I don't regret any of the decisions we made. And I rated an A plus. All right. Uh, and thank you, you can Governor. See that you can see that we are leading in vaccinations over there. We went quickly from a 47 car score to a point one. I mean, that's recognized in the United States. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Nestor. Before we move on, Art and Augustine has something to add on the PCR process. Thank you so much, Crystal. I just wanted to share with the media, um, the governor and I, uh, she had called me months ago when Hawaii first initiated its safe travels program. And that actually is a model that we can, as we're developing into the reopening, that we can frame our effort into. And what basically that offered Guam was an application process so that Hawaii would recognize our PCR and our results via the labs that we submitted as being CLIA certified. And that's what I was referring to earlier. And so there is a system in place that we can definitely replicate uh, working with Hawaii as a model and others that exist out there. So that's how our results are recognized with the state of Hawaii. When our residents go into the state of Hawaii to visit with a negative PCR is that we are registered with that as the state of Hawaii. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Thank you, Art. CJ or Kiko, any follow-up? A uh, quick question about the recent, uh, the six bills filed by the legislature, uh, the economic recovery bills. Are you considering these bills? Uh, do you know, could, could it be uh, that you could use the COVID relief aid for these bills? Thank you. You know, I looked at these bills by their titles and um, we're already doing all of these bills. Um, and so I, you know, I respect that the senators are thinking about it and I respect that they are considering ways to uh, improve the quality of our lives. But all these programs we're already doing. Any follow-up, CJ? That's all. Thank you. Have a great day. Jerry Partito, Pacific News Center. Yes. Uh, 
our primary tourism markets like Japan, Korea, and Taiwan may have their own uh, COVID tests. Are we going to accept the results from those tests if we if, if they visit in here? Art, I think you're the best person to answer that. Yes, Governor, yes, absolutely. Yes, we would have to coordinate our efforts with those respective uh, areas, those destinations to ensure that their test status, their test um, standards are in line with ours. And so that's something that we would have to work with them. Um, like I said earlier, when we looked at Hawaii and we applied for safe, safer travels, uh, their program, Safe Travels, I believe, um, we would do the same thing. We, we would reach out to these markets, work with their health department and their travel industry to ensure that we coordinate this prior to launching those markets or as we're launching those markets that those questions are answered. I don't have a clear answer for you this afternoon simply because I'm not familiar with their test platform, but uh, we will definitely as a health department need to reach out to them to discuss that further. Thank you. Uh, also on tourism, uh, probably for uh, Governor Gutierrez. Uh, Governor, our, our tourism industry has, has basically been on ice for almost a year now. Uh, when, we re when we accept visitors again on May, uh, can we give uh, visitors a, a, a good experience in here, uh, a good vacation? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, the first place they're gonna go to, the first group is going to be at my house. We're <laughs> gonna do a fiesta and really celebrate the first group of people coming into Guam. Uh, because we are uh, really trying to get tourism back the way it was in the 70s when we first started, that we are going to be Chamorro-centric, cultural-centric. We're gonna show them what made Guam the tourist destination that it was by the real people of Guam being the, the, the very reason why they come here. And so also, uh, in, I don't know if you people are, are missing all the good news. Like this morning, I saw the Lieutenant Governor and, and Vince Ariola walking down the street at the Tumon, cracking the whip, demolishing all those derelict buildings there. We're cleaning up the place. We're getting it ready so that when they come out, they see something a little different if they're return uh, tourists. But definitely, uh, we are going to show them something that uh, when they go into a restaurant, the new normal has become the very normal thing that they're doing because we've been doing it for the last two months and we're practicing right now. And uh, they'll, they'll be happy when they see a sign at the door that it says A from Public Health and Social Services and a WTTC from GVB that you are safe. And this place has been certified by WHO of the United Nations. So these are the things we're putting together to put a good frame of mind for the tourists to come here and know that we did our job. And the governor did her job bringing us to this point. And, and one last question for Governor Liu. Uh, governor Liu, are we still pushing through with the, with the plan to uh, build a new 300 million hospital, a brand new hospital? That 300 million would be half of the 600 million that we'll be getting from the federal government. Can, can, can we consider private partnerships instead, probably so that the, the cost will be lower? So yes, we need to build a new hospital. I am very determined that we build a new hospital. Uh, we have to. Uh, this hospital has, uh, I think, on its last leg of life. And uh, our people deserve no less than a very qualified um, hospital that can take care of any future uh, pandemic, any future uh, increases in in diseases and so forth. So the 300 million, like I said earlier, I think is a very wise investment for our hospital. It's a good use of our uh, monies to build this uh, facility because like I said, as a result of that, if we have to go out to borrow a little bit more, it'll be less of a dead burden to our people of Guam. Okay, thank you, Governor. Last but not least, Maureen Maritita, Mariana's Business Journal. Do you have any follow? Uh, just one, Crystal, thank you. Um, so, Governor, I know that you've um, tasked Governor Guterres with um, doing something about the permitting. 
which has been um, a problem and delayed. But what about Reven tax in general? Um, is that just part of the solution? I mean, the agency is so top heavy with responsibility. Are there any plans to, um, to diversify it, split it out further, improve it somehow? The Department of Revenue and Tax, yes, has a lot of responsibilities, and I think their responsibilities are um, relevant. And so what we are um, moving forward with the Department of Revenue and Tax to increase their efficiencies is, of course, to totally automate. Um, they, they've automated the business, uh, or sorry, the vehicular registration. They have uh, started automation for tax filing. Um, they are in the process of working to automate uh, driver's license and, of course, business licenses. So, uh, Maureen, I think the best uh, answer to your question is that if we automate Department of Revenue and Tax, I think they would be a little bit less stress on their responsibilities. And that's certainly what Daphne is working very hard on doing. And we are going to do it. I don't know if you've ever used the vehicular registration online, but I'm a big proponent of that. I had to register my mom's car and uh, we took it to a car inspection place that communicated with DRT. The results went straight to DRT. I went online and I registered my mom's car and I got a printout right away of her registration. And the tax came with the tag came two to three days later. And so I think what is also important, and I know Crystal's working with Daphne on this, is to push that out, to communicate that, because we're still seeing a lot of people coming to uh, physically register their vehicles when, you know, they can do it within minutes. So those are some of the things that we are looking at to improve is the uh, messaging, pushing out the campaign to use automation. And uh, it, it, when we are successful with that, I think uh, the people will be better served and uh, DRT will be able to uh, perform its responsibility in a less stressful environment. Uh, we're very happy with being, the Marachitas are very happy with being able to um, register their vehicles online. Yes, we would probably be even happier if we didn't have to um, pay a penalty for using credit cards online, uh, which can be- That's something uh, that, okay, so I'm glad you brought that up because that's a legislation issue. Um, what we have done is we've waived it, but um, it was the legislature that mandated that uh, convenience fee to be um, paid by the customers. So uh, I think we need to have legislation to, uh, reverse that, we're, we're willing to take that cost. Okay. Thank you very much. No further questions. Last call for any questions from any member of our media. Off the day, Nick with the post. I have a follow-up question. Uh, Gov, so over the past year, as we saw in, in uh, at the beginning of this press conference, we've experienced 133 lives lost, thousands tested positive for COVID-19, our number one industry, tourism still suffering, many families struggling and have lost their jobs. And so I just wanted some clarity on how you came to the conclusion that your grade is an A plus B with the, in the National Honor Society, you have no regrets and that you made the right decisions given everything that we've been through uh, the past year. Right. Uh, I base that really seriously, Nick, on the fact that uh, if we didn't make the decisions that we made, we probably would have lost more lives. And if you are tracking this, the FEMA model that came up, they said that if we didn't intervene quickly and make decisions, we could lose up to 3,000 lives. So that's how I'm basing it. I'm basing it on the fact that we didn't have to the doctors did not have to decide who's going to live and who's going to die. I'm basing it on the fact that uh, our hospital didn't crash when others who were better funded in the United States in the United States crashed. I'm basing it on the fact 
that although our cases were up, really the severity of our illness was not as was not as bad. I'm basing it on the fact that as a result of our directives and our initiatives, the people of Guam should really be the ones to get the A plus because they are the ones who followed our directives and our initiatives. And as a result, we are now opening our dining areas. We are now putting uh, students back to school. We are creating jobs and now we're gonna open tourism. So yes, every piece of that A plus is so well deserved to our people of Guam. Thank you. And also, has there been any discussion on removing the mask requirement that we've seen in places like Texas? Is, is that a reality for Guam? No, uh, no, not right now. And I'll tell you, I'm going to be very adamant about that. Because even in, uh, is it Kansas? Uh, uh, my good friend, the governor of Kansas, Governor um, Kelly, she, she mandated um, mask. One of her counties did mask and another county did not. The county that did not do mask had more lives lost and more positive cases. So that alone, I think demonstrates that wearing masks is a very big uh, mitigation efforts. Uh, I'll also tell you that the people in Texas, they're not following the governor's directive. They are wearing masks and they are social distancing. The businesses are scared. So. Yeah, sometimes, you know, governors have their own way of doing things, but I'm going to follow science and data. Thank you, Gov. Any other questions from any of our members of our media? None from me, thanks. Can I just say one thing about this 661, right? Because you know, there are senators out there saying that uh, I have rose colored glasses on and I'm, and I'm not really uh, uh, have an economic recovery plan. The 661 is an interim. We all know up here, everybody in the business community knows 661 is a bridge. It is a bridge. It is not the uh, sustainable source of funding for our people. And we're using that as a bridge. And, and I know that, you know, by 2022, 2023, we're gonna start having our tourism strengthened again, but we're gonna use these monies to get there. We're gonna use these monies to be able to support a multi-diverse industry so we can create more jobs, so people can work, so people can have income in a sustainable way. So I just wanna let those senators out there that, uh, you know, I don't have rose colored glasses. I am a clear vision. My vision is 2020. And so I just want them to know that. And our team knows that too. Our team's vision is very clear. The people of Guam's agenda is very clear. And that is to be safe, to be healthy, and let's revive our economy so we can have a sustainable means of revenue and funding. So I just wanna take this opportunity to make that because I think there's been some uh, I think unfounded and unsubstantiated uh, comments made, which I don't think is right uh, to, to do that to our people of Guam. If there are no further questions, I'll give the floor to Governor for her closing remarks. Um, thank you again uh, for this opportunity to be able to uh, present to you some really positive directions, I think, for our island and to be able to get halfway to some normalcy to our island. I think uh, we've had this virus for one year. And again, I just cannot overstate uh, the importance of our people's patience, the importance of our people's cooperation. And I totally understand and empathize with the anxiety and the fears that have started from the very beginning. And I think now we're seeing more light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but we can't get to that light 
if we don't continue with our mitigation public health preventive measures. And that is to slowly and gradually be cautious about uh, reopening our island, uh, reopening our businesses and so forth, and even our tourism. And uh, to also, again, be uh, influenced by science and data and to please continue to wearing your mask, social distancing and washing your hands. And, uh, you know, be careful when you're out there in the public. I just want to also say that the A plus for our people of Guam is very well deserved. And I'll, I'll tell you also why I think my decisions are of A plus is right on. I went to church last night at Jigo. And every person in there was wearing a mask, even children. And the priest, Father Goffigan, got up there and talked about the importance of modifying our Catholic traditions during Holy Week, during Holy Thursday, during Good Friday, and during the vigil, and also on Easter Sunday. And they modify it. And this was his words. We're modifying it to protect our people from this COVID. So everyone is on board on this one. And I just want to, I cannot overly uh, state my deep appreciation and gratefulness to all of you for bringing us where we are today. And yes, uh, you're A plus and you're all members of uh, our National Honor Society. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. That concludes today's press conference.